Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, the next talk we have coming up is Reinforcement Learning Based Dependency Resolution by Fredo Bacorni. Hopefully, I didn't butcher that. Uh, Fredo is a senior software engineer in the AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. Um, please let me know if you notice any issues with the video playback. Just getting started with it. Everyone, welcome to this talk. Right. Really about reinforcement learning based dependency resolution. Uh, this uh, video was created for DEFCON PUS, that is a virtual event in uh, uh, 2020. I hope you are staying safe. My name is Fridolin, and uh, let's start with a brief introduction about Project Dot. Project Dot is a project that uh, is started in a uh, thing called AI uh, COE in the office of the CTO, and all the ideas and uh, things I will explain were uh, invented in uh, this project. Uh, the project is uh, uh, about making OpenShift a better platform for running AI ML workflow workloads. And as uh, Python is the driving force for AI ML applications, uh, most of the things that I will describe uh, will apply to Python, but the ideas uh, that I will show uh, can be also applied to other programming languages and other uh, ecosystems, considering uh, nuances that, that differ uh, these ecosystems. Uh, why are we focusing on this? Uh, we know that software stacks are complex and uh, they are changing over time. So if you develop an application today, uh, it can uh, get old in one year and things change. So uh, it requires maintenance uh, and knowing how the, the application uh, behaves in the different runtime environments, considering um, uh, in the case of Python, uh, Python libraries, Python interpreter, uh, uh, native packages provided by the operating system, as well as uh, kernel kernel modules and down hardware, uh, which spans also a lot of uh, variations how you can uh, run your software. Uh, we are hosted on uh, GitHub, so feel free to browse our uh, code base. And uh, let's move on to agenda. Uh, I will talk slightly about dependency resolution in Python, but this will be really like brief introduction to uh, get the, the basic idea and principles uh, that are out there. And then I will show existing solutions and uh, their pros and cons. And uh, then we will move on and we will describe why we need another solution or why we uh, started inventing a new solution. And uh, the solution will use Monte Carlo Tree Search. So uh, I will slightly uh, discuss about Monte Carlo Tree Search and uh, its variation uh, for resolving high quality software stacks. And then we'll, we will plug this uh, algorithm into resolution pipelines, uh, which make a uh, resolver a configurable uh, piece of software. So let's start uh, with dependency resolution in Python. If you ever used some Python modules, you probably used this uh, this uh, this site. It's PyPI, the Python Package Index, and it's a repository of software uh, that was written mostly in uh, Python programming languages, uh, programming language. And as you can see, uh, there are quite a lot of releases, so it's more than two million releases of uh, Python modules available out there, uh, free uh, to use, open source. And you can download these uh, Python distributions and uh, use them uh, in your applications. These Python distributions can come also from other uh, indices or other, other sources. Um, so uh, an example can be TensorFlow, that is a, a machine learning library that's uh, produced by, by Google, uh, uh, which is published on PyPI. So I picked a version TensorFlow uh, 2.2.0, and uh, we uh, produced uh, another version of TensorFlow. Uh, it's an another build that is optimized for uh, AVX uh, instruction sets. 
so uh, it's more optimized and you can uh, retrieve it from another source. So uh, PyPI is just one source of these Python distributions and you can find uh, other sources on the internet and install uh, software from there. If uh, you install some uh, library, uh, more, most often it depends on uh, some other packages and uh, this fact is stated using uh, version range specification and uh, these dependencies can be also conditional. So for example, TensorFlow has nearly 23 uh, packages uh, that are dependencies of TensorFlow and uh, it has, for example, NumPy uh, with the given version main specification. Uh, then uh, there is Enum 3.4, is a backport uh, to older versions of Python. Uh, of Enum module is uh, available uh, in Python standard library starting version uh, 3.4. So there's no point uh, installing it uh, for uh, newer Python uh, interpreters. So that's why this uh, dependency is introduced conditionally uh, if the uh, Python uh, interpreter version is uh, older. As you can see, uh, these version main specifications do not imply uh, index or index URL, so uh, they really use uh, package name and uh, version range specification uh, that needs to be uh, satisfied in order to uh, uh, satisfy uh, dependency, uh, dependency graph or construct dependency graph and satisfy uh, resolve software stack. So uh, let's create some dependence graphs. Uh, I've already mentioned TensorFlow in version 2.2.0 that is published on PyPI. And um, by analyzing it, we observe that it has 23 dependencies. So here you can see them stated uh, all. Uh, so uh, you see version range specification, some dependencies are optional. Uh, uh, if uh, environment markers uh, are evaluated as true. And if we try to construct the dependence graph, uh, we really end up with uh, a lot of packages, a lot of software. So here's an example of TensorFlow 2.2.0. Again, it's the one uh, that is installed from PyPI the fork. And it has uh, some direct dependencies uh, stated as version uh, with version range specifications. And uh, these need to be uh, resolved. So for example, ABSL Py uh, needs to be in version that is uh, uh, able or equal to 0 0.7.0. And um, this needs to be resolved. So resolver needs to find uh, what versions satisfy this version range specification. So to this date, uh, there are, I think, six versions of ABLPI that are published on PyPI that satisfy this version range specification. For another dependency, it's more easy because uh, there's just one dependency that satisfies uh, this uh, version equality. Uh, for example, NumPy has a so for example, uh, the version range specification for NumPy satisfies uh, is satisfied uh, by 21 releases of NumPy, so things are getting worse. And um, uh, we would continue with uh, all 23 dependencies uh, that are direct dependencies of TensorFlow. These are direct dependencies, and uh, these dependencies can have also and usually have uh, other dependencies. Uh, meaning TensorFlow has some transitive dependencies uh, that need to be installed in order to run a TensorFlow uh, stack. So, for example, uh, SciPy will have also some dependencies. NumPy itself will have some dependencies. And we could continue and uh, we could see a quite large dependency graph. Uh, this dependency graph can uh, grow over time. So, for example, uh, in the case of ABSLPy, there's stated a version 0 0.7.0, uh, and it could lead to opening because uh, if maintainers of ABSLPy that are unaware that TensorFlow uh, uses uh, ABSLPy with some version uh, range specification, uh, release a new software, for example, a new ABSLPy in version 1.0.0. Uh, there might be incompatible API changes that will break all the installation of TensorFlow in version 2.2.0 uh, if uh, they uh, resolve ABSLPy to latest version uh, that is uh, released. 
The same can apply even uh, if there is a new minor release. In that case, uh, this software is again untested with uh, TensorFlow, considering TensorFlow has a uh, good test suit. So uh, again, we can end up with a broken software and there is uh, just a new release, one uh, single uh, library in the whole uh, dependency graph. So if we consider all the direct dependencies of TensorFlow and we compute number of number of combinations, uh, how we can install this software, uh, we can end up with uh, some number, this three uh, multiplied by 10 to the power of 13. So uh, this number is quite large and can grow uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, also uh, consider that we uh, have only direct dependencies. These direct dependencies have transitive dependencies. Uh, transitive dependencies, TensorFlow, so uh, this number uh, grows. And this number is uh, valid only uh, to this date. So if there are new releases, as in case of ABSLI, uh, this number simply grows. We uh, consider uh, releases that are available only on PyPI in this case. So there are other uh, package indices uh, that are used in the resolution process. Again, this number grows. So these are uh, uh, indices and have uh, patched versions of uh, some libraries with bug fixes and, and stuff like that. Uh, we also consider only uh, direct dependencies of TensorFlow. So if you uh, use uh, TensorFlow together with some another application, for example, uh, another uh, uh, other package, for example, Flask, you can imagine that uh, this grows and the dependency graph can be quite uh, extensive and can uh, become quite complex. So uh, if you take a look at the dependency resolution in Python, uh, this then we already know this dependency resolution is dependent on the environment. Uh, the example was enum 3.4. Uh, there was uh, an environment marker that stated when the given dependency should be installed into the stack. Things might be even more complicated because these dependencies might be uh, stated in setup by and uh, the final list of dependencies that should be installed uh, with software can uh, be uh, created uh, dynamically on pitch installation. That's why we created a tool that is called .solver, and this uh, solver can uh, inspect Python pages and check what dependencies uh, some uh, the given uh, library has. Uh, this solver runs inside uh, specific environments, so you have a uh, solver that is specific for BI8 uh, running Python v6, and another solver that is uh, specific for Fedora 32 running uh, Python 3.8. Uh, in uh, these environments, some, some packages can uh, have different uh, dependencies, so we really need to inspect uh, how uh, the given package behaves in these environments. In other words, we invest CPU time and we pre-compute dependencies for a later dependency graph construction that we will do uh, later on uh, in this uh, talk. I would recommend uh, 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 an article that was published by Dustin Ingram and uh, it's called Why PyPI Doesn't Know Your Project Dependencies. It briefly discusses uh, this topic. Uh, we created also another uh, article that is called uh, Solving Python, Python Dependencies and How to Be Python's PIP uh, article series. And uh, it basically describes why PyPI doesn't know uh, Python dependencies, but uh, Todd's uh, solver knows it. Okay, so let's take a look at existing solutions and their pros and cons when uh, resolving software stacks. Uh, I took a list, a listing of uh, resolvers from uh, packaging.python.org uh, and uh, you are probably familiar uh, with PIP, that is the recommended tool for installing Python packages. Um, then there's uh, PIPEN that uh, also manages a virtual environment, manages a log file that is kept, kept with, in sync with uh, Python packages and Python module that you installed. And then there is PIP tools, uh, which uh, create some locking mechanism uh, on top of requirements in requirements.txt. That is, again, another, another uh, format for describing uh, dependencies. Uh, there's also community efforts similar to PIPEN that is called Poetry. 
and web3 uh, tries to manage uh, also virtual environment but also the life cycle of a module that is released on uh, PyPI or other uh, Python uh, package index. Uh, Pippen does not have this assumption that uh, uh, modules that are managed by Pippen will be released uh, to uh, some uh, Python uh, package index. There is also MicroPipen or MicroPipen. Uh, this tool was developed in Project Todd and it does not actually implement any resolver but is uh, complementing uh, all uh, the tools that are already stated and it provides a lightweight uh, tool uh, that can be used to install the MNCs uh, uh, that are managed by uh, pip tools, pipen, poetry, or raw requirements, txt files. We use this uh, tool uh, for install dependencies in containerized uh, environments uh, such as S2I, uh, such as OpenShift S2I. Okay, so why do we need another solution? Why do we need another resolver uh, that needs to be implemented? Or uh, why? What's, what's the story behind? So all these tools that implement resolver try to install latest software. And what if the latest software is not the great software? What is it? Why? What if that software is not the software that I would like to use? If you uh, recall that uh, back with uh, hypothetically uh, released ABL Pi in version 1.0.0 that broke our our uh, software stack, uh, these things happen, and it's quite issue uh, because. Uh, it breaks the application and uh, one or two years later you can end up with uh, a software that you cannot run because you don't know what dependencies should be uh, should be um, installed in order, order to run your software. So let's create a tool that uh, installs packages that are installable into your environment. Uh, that's first assumption. So there are no supply issues, maintainers provided correct uh, correct uh, packaging, uh, so the uh, Python distributions are installed into your environment. Then uh, we want to install software that runs in the given environment, so if we are running uh, Python uh, 3, we don't want libraries uh, that are not Python 3 compliant, for example or if there are some breaking changes in uh, Python uh, across releases, we want to run software that uh, respects these, cha these changes. Uh, then we want to install uh, software that correctly runs, so there are no bugs on application level. We want to install software that performs well, so if we are running TensorFlow uh, computations, and we have AVX2 instruction sets available on our CPU, we want to uh, install TensorFlow uh, that is optimized for uh, our uh, CPU uh, with AVX2 instruction set. Uh, that's uh, one uh, example. And at the same time, we want to uh, install software that is not prone to known vulnerability. Uh, CVEs at one uh, CVE example. But if I'm running uh, some uh, production uh, components, uh, I would like to uh, be sure that it's uh, security uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's not vulnerable and it's secure to run it. Okay, so let's move on and let's uh, define a way how to find high quality software stacks. And uh, we will discuss Monte Carlo research algorithm. Uh, before we go deeper into that algorithm, uh, I would like to say why we uh, use this algorithm. So it was not. Uh, decision like from one day to another that we will use this algorithm but we experimented with different approaches that ended up with different uh, results so uh, we had quite extensive journey uh, to to come up uh, to to go with uh, Monte Carlo research and the very first effort uh, that we uh, made was uh, performing computations directly on the dependency graph uh, this uh, idea is described more in the linked uh, talk. But basically we load the wall dependency graph and uh, we tried to uh, adjust it in a way that uh, the resolution process finds uh, the best candidate uh, that is scored respecting uh, packages in the in the result software stack. Uh, so uh, come up with, with the high quality software. However, this uh, approach was not good because uh, it required a lot of queries to the database and uh, basically the program uh, kept querying the database. 
Uh, then we tried to optimize it using neural combinatorial optimization with reinforcement learning where we used a uh, neural network. Uh, but again, that solution was, was not uh, scalable and not nice. It did not resolve anything uh, real world. Then we came up with uh, adaptive simulated annealing uh, that was successful. Uh, the resolution was lazy, so uh, the, the queries to, to the database were really the queries that uh, were required uh, when uh, the state space of uh, during simulated annealing was sampled. Uh, this approach is uh, documented or described in uh, linked talk and then uh, we came up with an idea of using reinforcement learning so uh, there were implemented two main approaches uh, the first one was temporal difference learning and uh, finally we compared it to Monte Carlo research and Monte Carlo research uh, was the uh, algorithm uh, or is the algorithm that uh, we use as of now for resolving software stacks why well, I will tell it uh, I will say it in, in a few minutes so, what is Monte Carlo research? Uh, if you browse uh, Wikipedia, it will say something like, in computer science, Monte Carlo research is a heuristic search algorithm for some kinds of decision processes, most notably those employed in software that plays board games. In that context, Monte Carlo research is used to solve the game tree. Okay, so we are playing some games, but not really uh, in the resolution process. There is no real opponent when uh, uh, we want to resolve the first stacks. So at first the idea uh, looked shady, but uh, with some adjustments to Monte Carlo research algorithm, we were able uh, to apply uh, principles that are in Monte Carlo research. And we created a variation of Monte Carlo uh, research, which uses adaptive simulated annealing. Uh, so for balancing exploration and exploitation. So uh, I will talk about this uh, in a minute as well. Uh, the real opponent that uh, we created is imaginary component because we are not really playing any board games. And this imaginary uh, opponent uh, is CPU time or time um, needed to satisfy user requests. So we wanted to have our recommendation engine as, uh, as uh, responsive as possible. So if a, if a user comes to us and asks what software uh, should he or she use when running TensorFlow, we wanted to give recommendations in a reasonable time. And that's the opponent uh, we are uh, playing against. Uh, we know already that the state space of all the possibilities, all the packages that are uh, uh, possible or available in the dependency graph, that step space is, is too large, so uh, we need, really need some heuristics how to how to browse the dependency graph and how to behave in, in the dependency graph. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with Monte Carlo research or uh, model three uh, reinforcement learning methods, uh, you probably know Mark on this process. Uh, I will talk about this uh, process, but basically we pull resolution process as an MDP that needs to of MDP meaning Markov decision process. Uh, we are looking for software that has high quality. So uh, we want to solve MDP by uh, accumulating high uh, reward and uh, software stacks with highest possible uh, cumulative reward are uh, the software stacks that we are looking for, the software stacks that have high uh, quality. Uh, we will dive into this idea uh, as well. Uh, it's worth to note here that Monte Carlo research is one type of predictor uh, in our component, in our recommendation engine that is called advisor. And uh, the predictor is abstraction that we've created in the implementation. So uh, there are also other um, abstractions. So uh, you uh, see predictor that is the implementation of Monte Carlo research. Uh, uh, adjusted uh, using adaptive simulated annealing principles. And then we have other predictors uh, for resolving uh, latest software stacks or uh, uh, other predictor that uses temporal trans learning or another uh, predictor that uses adaptive simulated annealing. And there are also other predictors that we've experimented with. For example, a predictor that tries to resolve uh, always uh, one package to compute, uh, compute uh, all the combinations 
uh, in the tech. So, for example, if you want to uh, test TensorFlow in, uh, in, uh, with, with different uh, versions of NumPy, we can pack a predictor uh, that can narrow the resolution process uh, to uh, this uh, set of software stacks much faster. So, uh, this is the idea of a predictor abstraction. And uh, in the slides, you will also see other attractions such as Resolver that abstracts away uh, the resolution process uh, that, uh, that is combined uh, with Python standards. So the resolution process um, resolves software specs uh, that uh, respect version specifications and also uh, environment markers. In the in the resolution in the in the wall resolution process, and then predictor X uh, predictor X as a um, guider or as a guide who who helps a predictor to resolve uh, software stacks. Uh, there is also another abstraction that is uh, a scoring pipeline, and I will talk about it uh, later on. So, Markov decision process. Uh, again, we will check a uh, few sentences from uh, Wikipedia and then we will dive into uh, examples to understand uh, the idea and uh, adjustments we've made uh, more deep or deeper. So in mathematics, a Markov decision process is a discrete time stochastic control process. It provides a mathematical framework for modeling decision making in situations where outcomes are partly random and partly under the control of the decision maker. NDPs are useful for studying optimization problems solved uh, by dynamic programming and reinforcement learning. So this is the definition that was obtained from uh, Wikipedia, but uh, we will take a look at MDP that was uh, kind of adjusted to our needs and um, adjusted uh, so that uh, it could be used in a resolution process. So uh, a resolver uh, that is using uh, that is uh, implemented in uh, Tot is using a, a list or set of states. Uh, this uh, attraction is called beam, so it's a beam of states. And these states are partially resolved. So uh, they do not state all the dependence, uh, all the dependencies that form a final stack, but uh, but they keep just few uh, few resolved uh, packages or non-resolved packages and packages that are about to be resolved. So each, each state has two sets. One uh, corresponds to packages that are resolved, and another set that has um, that holds uh, unresolved dependencies. If a state holds no unresolved dependencies, it means it's a final state, and all dependencies that are present in the resolved set form the final stack that is uh, resolved. If, uh, if a resolved uh, set has no dependencies, that means uh, that you have an initial state from where we uh, start uh, by expanding unresolved dependencies, in, the, in which case unresolved dependencies are uh, direct dependencies of our uh, application. So uh, the whole uh, process, uh, uh, Markov decision process, is basically uh, solving uh, or resolving the dependency, dependency graph. Uh, this resolution respects Python dependency uh, specification as stated before, and uh, there are uh, actions uh, that are uh, done. So I've already mentioned that uh, we have resolved set and unresolved set of dependencies. And if we move a dependency from unresolved set to resolved set, uh, then uh, this is called an action uh, in MDP. In uh, uh, resolver's implementation, it's called resolver steps. Uh, by doing so, by moving uh, unresolved dependency to the resolved uh, dependency set, um, uh, we obtain some reward signal that can be positive or negative, uh, meaning uh, if including a given package uh, in the stack, uh, is uh, something we want to do, like positive, then we have positive signal. And if uh, it has some drawbacks, such as uh, the given package has uh, vulnerabilities, uh, including it in the software stack can have a negative impact. And in that case, the signal is negative. 
Uh, after the resolution process is done, uh, we backpropagate information about, about uh, reports computed, uh, so uh, information about uh, accumulated uh, uh, rewards. Uh, that is case of Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, in case of uh, TD learning, uh, the backpropagation is done immediately after after step is done. So that's the only uh, difference between Monte Carlo tree search and TD, lear uh, TD learning when it comes to implementation. Okay, so uh, maybe let's have a look at uh, some details. So uh, let's consider uh, that we have some state as n. And uh, this state is formed uh, out of resolved dependencies set and unresolved dependencies set, as stated before. Uh, in res resolved dependencies set, we have Flask in a specific version that is installed from pypi.org. And in the unresolved dependencies set, we have uh, dependencies that can be included into uh, uh, our software tech in specific versions. So I have options. Like if I want to use, uh, if I want to include click in my uh, in my software stack, then I have two options. One is install click in version uh, 6.7 or install click uh, 7.0 uh, from PyPI or uh, which one? That's up to Plicter, which, which will tell the resolver which version uh, should uh, use. Uh, so we have this uh, state S n, uh, resolved dependencies, unresolved dependencies, and we have also score uh, that corresponds to uh, this uh, state. And what we want to do, we want to, in this case, we are programmers, we want to maximize this score. Uh, if we would be uh, mathematicians, we would probably uh, minimize that score, but we want to maximize it. So this state S n corresponds to uh, this node in the graph. And uh, here are encoded uh, options that we can uh, take. So uh, we have this state as n, and what we do, we ask predictor which dependency should uh, resolver, meaning I, uh, which dependency should I choose to resolve as first stack. And a predictor, it can be MCDS, Monte Carlo Research, DD Learning, uh, or it can be uh, Adaptive Simulator, Nilling, any other uh, predictor says that we want to resolve, uh, we should resolve Jinja in version 2.10.2 from PyPI.org. So let's do it. If we do it, then uh, we need to adjust the state in a way that we don't uh, uh, consider Jinja 2 as unresolved dependency and move it to a uh, resolved dependencies set. This move or this uh, action that was taken uh, says that we have uh, immediate uh, reward signal that is 0 0.2. So we adjust our score in newly created state uh, so that it uh, at 0 0.2 as a reward signal that we obtained. Then uh, what we need to also do, uh, as we move to Jinja to resolve dependencies, we need to resolve dependencies of, of Jinja. So uh, we need uh, to ask resolver what uh, Jinja 2, uh, what are dependencies of Jinja 2. Uh, so in this case, uh, it says markup safe inversion uh, above 0 0.23 and bubble uh, above 0 0.8 that need to be resolved in specific versions that are known, uh, that are known and, um, uh, and are available. I skipped uh, this part. Uh, the reward signal that we obtain uh, can be also none or infinite. infinite. Uh, this is just implementation detail. So if uh, the given uh, transition would not be valid, uh, we uh, would obtain a reward signal that is a number. And if the resolution process would lead to a final state, uh, then uh, the, uh, the final uh, or the uh, reward signal would be infinite. Uh, that would be propagated to predictor, so predictor knows uh, that expanding this dependency leads to a final state. Okay, so um, we know that we need uh, add uh, unresolved unre unre dependencies uh, from, uh, from resolving Ninja 2 in that specific version, and again, uh, add new packages to unresolved dependencies. Uh, in state SN plus 4, and uh, we continue uh, this process until we don't have any uh, pages in the unresolved dependencies set. And um, 
in that case, we would have uh, the final state, which states fully resolved uh, software stack with uh, some score uh, that uh, corresponds to uh, uh, cumulative uh, re uh, reward signal. So uh, this was one uh, performing. Uh, this was performed one action uh, during the Monte Carlo uh, tree search uh, resolution, and uh, in case of Monte Carlo tree search, we continue uh, this process until we reach one lead vote, and uh, then we backpropagate information about about score to parent nodes, meaning the nodes that were created out of uh, the uh, original score. So in case of uh, state SN plus four uh, that we uh, computed, we propagate uh, information about score uh, to uh, parent nodes so uh, the predictor can learn how how uh, the resolution process looks like and how these packages or uh, how these software texts are scored in the wall state phase. Uh, I already uh, said that we had to uh, adjust Monte Carlo tree search and uh, that adjustment uh, lies in uh, balancing exploration and exploitation. These are two terms. Uh, if we want to observe the state space, like how it behaves when uh, we resolve certain packages, then we do exploration. We learn how uh, software stacks should be resolved in order to come up with a set of packages form the final stack with a uh, very high uh, final score. Uh, then uh, what we do, we do exploitation. So a predictor learns uh, how to resolve software stacks and then uh, during the resolution process uh, this uh, predictor uh, knows uh, which packages should be resolved in order to maximize the reward signal. It's quite good to say here that in opposite to board games we uh, most of the time don't end up with same uh, state, same node uh, during the uh, during the uh, uh, gameplay or resolution. So uh, what we do, we average uh, how uh, the state space behaves when we add a certain package. So on average, for example, if we add Jinja 2 to our stack in the version that we saw, uh, on average, uh, we uh, obtain a reward of uh, 0 0.2. Then we uh, then we state this fact uh, in the in the predictors um, uh, predict, uh, predictors history. Okay. Uh, so uh, to balance explore, exploration and exploitation, uh, we use uh, adaptive simulating annealing principles. In which case uh, we have temperature uh, that is set to some high number, and over time it decreases. And factors uh, that uh, form this adaptive simulated annealing are our um, number of stacks that uh, are uh, resolved, uh, or number of iterations, number of uh, rounds done in the resolver, uh, number of actions taken, and so on. So we really uh, limit uh, time spent in, in the resolution uh, to come up with recommendations. We also designed a random number generator that's called uh, terminal random uh, that helps us to narrow the resolution more closely to uh, latest uh, software but uh, not use uh, latest uh, 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 all the time. So uh, this was uh, the idea about resolving software stacks in really large uh, state space and as you've already seen there are too many possibilities to be checked and a number of combinations grow uh, really significantly with each package uh, added uh, to the software stack. So we already know that there is no, no way how to check all the possibilities in any real world applications. So uh, we created these heuristics to find the high quality software stack as soon as possible. We found that reinforcement learning is the way to go to resolve high quality software stacks. The last thing that I would like to discuss is a resolution pipeline. So you already know that we are taking uh, some actions uh, in MDP, and these actions correspond to steps. So uh, we created an abstraction that's called resolution pipeline, and this pipeline is created out of units. These units have their separate semantics. So there is a unit that scores uh, packages based on uh, performance, based on uh, security, and stuff like that. Uh, the idea is uh, that uh, latest software is not the greatest one, so uh, let's plug uh, pipeline units that have some knowledge 
about software and can 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 guide a predictor the resolution uh, by scoring and uh, uh, sending the reward signal uh, during the resolution. So we have different pipeline units based on their semantics. Uh, they do one thing and they uh, do it properly, so they follow uh, Unix philosophy, and uh, they form some kind of uh, programmable interface to the resolution process. As we will see, these pipeline units are very uh, straightforward to implement. Uh, the user of, of uh, this recommendation engine or the, the programmer of, of this um, uh, scoring uh, pipeline uh, does not need to know about all these MDPs and, and stuff like that, so uh, it's abstracted away. These, uh, it's important to also state that these uh, pipeline units are plugged into the resolution process dynamically. That means uh, they are uh, asked to be included. Uh, I will uh, show you in a minute how it works. So the resolver uh, accepts a vector, a vector of, uh, of uh, information, so for example direct dependency, software environment, hardware that is used, uh, libraries that are used together uh, some static source code analysis, like what peak calls are performed, also recommendation type. So if a user wants to uh, use secure or, uh, or performant, performant uh, software, so these are input vectors into the resolution pipeline that is uh, created out of units. And then uh, together with a resolver and predictor, uh, there are created pinned uh, down software specs considering knowledge uh, that we have about uh, these packages. So let's have a look at an example of a pipeline unit. This pipeline unit is called SEP and scores uh, TensorFlow builds that are optimized for AVX2 enabled CPU processors. User uses AVX2 enabled uh, processor. So uh, there are two uh, important methods. One is called run and the other one is called should include, that is class method. And uh, there is also AVX2 uh, CPUs. Uh, so Let's take a look at the implementation. The listing of CPUs is quite straightforward. It uh, holds a couple of two integers uh, that uh, describe CPU family and CPU model of interprocessors that support AVX2. Uh, so these are basically constants. Then uh, there is that should include class method uh, that asks uh, this step whether it should be included in the resolution process. So it checks what recommendation type user uh, requested and if the recommendation type should be performance or uh, the user wants stable software, uh, we uh, include the uh, pipeline on it. We also include it if and only if the user uses a uh, CPU that is capable of AVX2 instruction set. Uh, so uh, that's the only case when this pipeline on it is included. The semantics behind uh, this, uh, this class method is that if it returns none, uh, the pipeline unit is not included, and if, if it returns a dictionary, uh, then it is included. Uh, the dictionary has a special meaning. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but uh, there is a reason behind uh, returning a dictionary. Then there is another method that is called run, and this corresponds to uh, the action that is performed in the MDP. So we are in some state, and we want to go into another state, and that's another state is uh, created by including package version into the current state. So the run method accepts two parameters uh, that are state and package version to be included into in the state. If the package version had to be included is TensorFlow and it uh, supports AV uh, and the the included TensorFlow supports AVX2 instruction set, then we propagate a reward signal that is uh, positive, and we uh, also uh, say some informative message to user. So uh, we are coming to the end. Uh, this was brief introduction to the resolution process uh, that is uh, using reinforcement learning. Uh, this all was done in Project TOT, so uh, if you are interested, feel free to reach out to us at TOT Station Ninja. We are part of AICOE, Office of the CTO, so you can also find us on Google Chat. Uh, the source code is hosted on GitHub, the TOT Station organization. We have also a Twitter account with a TOT Station handle, handle and uh, that handle has some uh, dash in it, so be careful who you follow. And we have also a YouTube channel where we uh, where we 
periodically uh, send uh, or publish uh, videos from our Scrum sessions and also some interesting talks uh, that uh, we found. Uh, if you uh, follow us, uh, you will find more information about distributed environments, about, for example, Argo workflows, Ecton pipelines, uh, RFCD, uh, all these cool stuff, like also performance of machine learning uh, libraries and stuff like that. So not just about this reinforcement learning algorithm, but uh, also other things that might be interesting uh, to you. This way, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, hopefully see you next time. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks a ton for that, Frido. That was really interesting. Um, <laughs> Looking at the schedule, we're pretty tight on time right now. Um, so, I mean, you can hop on video right now in case we have a question or two. But otherwise, I'd recommend we uh, move the conversation over to the breakout room. Okay, it seems like we're not really seeing any questions. So, again, uh, thanks a lot, Frido. Um, yeah, have a great day.